Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, Five Things to Consider About Data Mesh and Data Governance, sponsored today by Data.World. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A section, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, Zoom defaults the chat to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change it to network with everyone. And to find the Q&A or the chat panels, you may click those icons found in the bottom middle of your screen. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days, containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce you to our speakers for today, Tim Gasper, Juan Cicada, and Paul Gams. Tim is the VP of Product at Data.World and co-host of the web show and podcast catalog and cocktails. He previously served as Director of Product at um, Jan Rain, Head of Product and Marketing at Bitfusion, and VP of Product and Global Offerings Manager at InfoChips. Tim has over 13 years of product management, and product marketing experience and is a writer and speaker of entrepreneurship, lean startup methodology, analytics, and AI. Juan is the principal scientist at data.world. He joined through at the acquisition of Capcenta, a company he founded as a spinoff from his PhD research in computer science from the University of Texas at Austin. His global, his goal is to reliably create knowledge from inscrutable data. His research and industry work has been on designing and building knowledge graph for enterprise data integration. Paul has worked in development and technical sales with a database system for over 35 years, and he has been at Snowflake since 2017. He is currently the technical lead for Snowflake's data governance and data security partners. And with that, I will give the floor to our speakers to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Awesome. Thanks so much, Shannon. We really appreciate you and the Dataversity team giving us that warm introduction. And uh, I know that we're very, very excited to speak to you all today about data mesh and data governance uh, coming from our unique perspectives, both from data.world, um, you know, working in the catalog space, as well as from Snowflake, uh, really uh, providing that data cloud. So thank you for having us. And uh, Paul and Juan, anything you want to chime in as, uh, as we kind of kick things off here? Yeah, thanks. Thanks again for having us. We're really excited to talk about data mesh and the importance of data governance and excited to talk to all of you today about it. Likewise, I'm very excited for this conversation and also to be able to provide our point of view. I think data mesh is something that we're all hearing about and, and our goal here is to be able to provide our honest, our bold point of view of how we should be thinking about data mesh and data governance. So let's kick this off, Tim. I think that's a great point. There's a lot of hype and interest around data mesh and we need to bring clarity to it. And hopefully this, this webinar really does that for you today by focusing on five key aspects that you may not have considered. So just before we jump into the content, really quickly kind of introducing who we are and why we're kind of talking to you today. Uh, Paul, do you want to start us off uh, with, with Snowflake? And then I'll talk a tiny bit about data.world. Sure. Just for those of you that haven't heard of or don't really know what Snowflake is, it's we, we uh, call ourselves the data cloud, and that's really what we are. It's a single platform, lots of workloads that all run on that single platform, and the goal being no data silos. All your data accessible by all of the users you know, for all of the analytics that you need. Awesome. And... Data.world is the modern data catalog. We are 100% cloud-based, built on a knowledge graph, really tapping into that technology that companies like Facebook and Netflix use in order to understand and make their data very valuable. And we're trying to make data discovery governance analysis easier. Um, and I think what's really exciting, uh, you know, and why we love working with the folks over at Snowflake is that when you've got a really great data cloud environment and you've got a great data catalog, all sorts of things are possible to improve access to and the power of your data, including really helping address needs around data mesh. So we're very excited to talk to you today about some best practices and bringing some of our customer experiences into the mix as well. So why data mesh? Why are we talking about this today and why is this such a big deal? Well, it's clear that over many, many years here, as we've tried to wrap our arms around our data, and as big trends have happened, such as in recent years, things like big data and machine learning, that simply 
addressing data as something that we kind of have to just put in one place uh, and assume that the right thing is going to happen just isn't happening, right? And it's not necessarily a technology problem, although there are factors that affect uh, our challenges around data that are technology related. Actually, a lot of it is a people and a process problem. And so in just the last couple of years, this idea of data mesh has really come to the fore and really put a spotlight on how data in terms of technology, people and process all has to work together. Uh, and the big problems that Data Mesh is trying to solve is that, first of all, when you take a monolithic or an isolated approach to data, that it doesn't scale, particularly socially. And often, data is being treated as an afterthought. You may have heard of the sort of adage uh, like data exhaust, or even data is the new oil, which takes a very sort of narrow and singular perspective around data instead of really thinking about how to take data and make it a first-class citizen. And why do we care? Well, the number of systems is exploding. Think of all the different SaaS tools you have to use every day. The complexity of data is expanding, and yet the importance of getting value of our out of our data is, um, is uh, more central than ever. And so we want to really prevent processes and teams from becoming a bottleneck for the business, and we want to tap into the value of data more. And so Data Mesh has really captured the excitement of a lot of folks, both technical and non-technical, on, hey, maybe we can scale data socially. Maybe we can put data in the center. Maybe we can find a way to empower the broader business around the data and really get more value out of it. And we're excited to talk more about that with you all today. And really core to Data Mesh are the four Data Mesh principles. Uh, Jamak Dagani, who is really the, the primary leader, the thought leader around Data Mesh uh, and, and has really popularized it, highlights these four principles um, throughout her works around data mesh. Um, and you can particularly see a couple of the seminal articles, uh, the blog posts that, that really kind of started this whole trend there on the martinfowler.com site. And these four data mesh principles are domain-centric ownership and architecture. It's really about empowering the teams that know most about the data to take accountability around that data, own the cleaning and the refinement of that data, and also be involved in the metadata and governance around that, things like compliance, like lineage, like discoverability. Data as a product is the second data mesh principle. And that's really about thinking of your data not as exhaust or just something that you have to deal with incidentally, but rather putting it in the center and considering the end users. Who is using the data? What are they using it for? And is it easy for them to use? Is it discoverable? These are really important aspects to really provide good experiences around data. The third principle is self-service data platform. And this is the most technology oriented of these four. And that's around having great tools and platforms that empower people to do what they need to do around data, right? So if you're empowering these different domains to create and develop these data products, do they have domain agnostic, easy to use, low maintenance tools that let them do that kind of data and metadata work? And can they really repeat patterns, right? Can they take the best practices of the past and leverage them into the future? And then finally, the fourth key principle of data mesh is federated computational governance or federated governance. And this is really about some aspects do have to be centralized and identifying what those key aspects are that should be centralized, uh, centralized like interoperability and standards, constraints, that it's important to make sure that those things are consistent across your organization. And really to think of ways to automate these policies, right? Can you use some of the great tools and technologies and capabilities that your self-service data cloud or catalog provides to really make developing, managing, and maintaining those domains and those data products much easier. And I know Juan and Paul, y'all have, have been working in data mesh quite a bit as well. Um, you know, which of these uh, principles stand out the most to you? And is there anything that you'd like to add on this particular slide? Yeah, I'll be talking about a little bit about federated governance and how important that is. Uh, it in order to really uh, put out the right products, the right data products, and make sure that 
it, it's governed in, the, in a similar way across so that it's all secure and it can all be trusted. Um, it, it's really important for that to be taken very seriously um, so that you really can put out the, you know, get these uh, data products out correctly. And I, I, want, I want to add is if I had to choose one, the one I would, I, I'm really excited about which is the big game changer here is that second one is data as a product. It's the idea of bringing product thinking into data. We're doing this for so many things. We do it for software, right? We should be doing this for data. And I think we're really excited to share our very specific point of view, talk about what, we're, what, we, what we will be presenting as the data product ABCs of our concrete way of thinking, what does data as a product actually look like? So very excited about this one. I think this is a game changer right now. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I can't wait for us to get into that. Um, as we talk about these, obviously that fourth one is really important and affects really all the four principles. Uh, Paul, like what, what are the big challenges around governance that folks really have to focus on as they're, as they're stepping into this world of data mesh? Yeah, and these are the challenges that we, at, at Snowflake, this is what we see all the time. It's the fact that the data is everywhere. It's in a lot of different formats. It's in a lot of different systems. Um, it's siloed. It's, it, it's secured in different ways. If you wanna to try to bring all of that data together, there's gotta be a way to govern all of that data. Um, and it's really complicated um, to understand all of the different challenges you have around all of the data, different, or, different uh, lines of business within an organization will think of the same data in different ways. And you need some way to manage all that complexity. And then, the, and then the last one, um, just uh, doing security and governance and getting it correct. Um, things keep, ch regulations keep changing. Uh, you know, it's very rigid. And so you really need to make sure that you can understand your data and, uh, and the policies around it in order to secure it correctly. Yeah, it's if it, it's one thing to actually wrap your hands around your security environment, and then and then the regulations they change, they evolve, and now you have to do it all over right. again, right? How can you be dynamic exactly. to that? Yeah, and and it's really important. So uh, to first know your data, right? So you have to in order to be able to build the right data products and to govern them correctly, you really have to understand them. You have to know what data you have, how it applies to the business. You have to be able to classify the data and understand what's sensitive, what can be shared, what needs to be, you know, shared in a in a secured way or masked in some other in some way, and then you need to be able to see who's uh, understand who's using that data, track its usage, track its lineage, know where that data came from. Once you've got that understanding, then you can really protect your data. You can secure the sensitive data. Um, either with policies uh, or with encryption or however you protect your data in a standardized way. And, and, and then that leads you to be able to unlock your data, allow that data to be shared as a data product um, without and knowing that you're not giving away anything that you really shouldn't be giving away. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I know a lot of people talk about find, understand, trust. And actually, I kind of like know, protect, unlock even better because you get you get kind of an additional aspect around protect and actually getting access to your data, right? Securely, but in a democratized way. Right. So, you know, governance has, as you've heard Paul mention, uh, you know, it presents a lot of challenges. And on, and on top of all of that, a lot of times we try to approach this in a very top-down way, uh, in a cumbersome way, um, and really with defense in mind, right? And obviously that's critical, right? We don't want to um, get in trouble with these different industry or um, governmental reg regulations. Um, but if you only focus on that, you create additional bottlenecks, which is one of the fears uh, of data mesh that we're trying, the data mesh tries to address, right? To really democratize and push more responsibility out to the different parts of the business and, and scale things. And so when you think about the future of data governance and what it needs to be, it really needs to be more about the rules of cooperation and collaboration, the process of doing data and analytics work together. 
and capturing knowledge in real time so that you can actually move through that knowledge, protect, and unlock flow more quickly, more um, collaboratively, uh, and actually take a use case driven approach. And if you think about how catalogs fit in as well, right? Governance is about discoverability, not just about data protection, and catalogs help you understand and trust. Um, you're trying to eliminate silos, and um, catalog environments can help share uh, and make uh, data accessible to everyone. Uh, you really want to accelerate time to value, not, not create more bottlenecks and burdens. And then finally, you don't want to have to install software in order to address your needs around data governance and around data mesh. Uh, and I think that's one of the most exciting things about things like Snowflake and data.world is the fact that uh, these are cloud native um, uh, approaches that are highly available and can scale to all sorts of ways that your organization needs to scale. And so with that, we want to really transition into the five things to consider about data mesh and data governance. Really important points that some of which you may know and some of which may be a little surprising to you. So uh, we'll dive straight into what is the scope of your data mesh? A lot of folks uh, think about data mesh and it, be, it, it can be quite daunting, right? They look uh, at their existing environment uh, and it looks something like this. And if you're like most of us, your environment's actually probably about 30 or 50 times more complicated than this. Um, and that could be pretty challenging when you're thinking about, oh, what should I actually focus on uh, when I'm trying to develop my data mesh, right? Um, and one of the big aspects, that first principle of data mesh that's really important here is the concept of domains, the idea that there are topical or functional areas within your business where expertise is consolidated and where you're going to be creating your data products and where experts are going to take accountability around the data. And this is actually an image that um, is on that martinfowler.com website that Jamak Dagani put together that is actually an example of Spotify. Uh, and the, in the example of Spotify, which for those uh, that aren't as familiar, is an uh, online streaming music service, um, they have various domains in their data and in their organization around artists, around podcasts, which are a very unique medium and a unique area of expertise. They have expertise around this concept of the users, the customers and the users themselves. And then there's the music, the files and the information and the genres of these different pieces of music and of videos that are on their platform. And each of these domains have unique technologies, unique areas of expertise, unique parts of the business that work on them. But each of them has a relationship with each other. Right. So, for example, a user profile might need to pull information on the music that somebody is watching or listening to um, in order to really be complete. And so when you think in your own organization, there are these domains that exist, whether they're functional oriented, maybe they're oriented more around the products that you bring to market. Uh, perhaps there are some things that are in the middle or in between. And these domains come together. Um, to form sort of the overall area of your business and products actually tie into that. So you see things like O and D in here. These are different products that might be connected to these different um, domains that they have ownership around. So if we map that to this diagram, you can kind of see an example of, of this here. Um, and I know that, um, Paul, this is an example um, that the Snowflake team kind of uses to walk through kind of mapping domains to your data environment. Do you want to walk through some of the main points on this one? Yeah, sure. There's a, there's a couple of really important points here. So the first is that the domain is really the, I think, I think the way it's described is the output port. You're going to, you have a set, of, a set of data, a schema that is, that's the data product. And the stuff to the left of that, that's really the, the, you know, how I put it all together, all the ETL processes or whatever processes I use to build that data product. Each one of the domains can do that differently. And that's not really that what needs to be exposed out to the consumers. Really, the consumer just cares about the final product. Um, the other important part is point is that domains can be made up of other domains. So, you know, in this example, I have a customer do domain, I have a help desk and support domain, an orders domain, 
and the customer 360 domain is really just made up of all of those. And, and the expertise there is how to bring those other domains together, make that available to those consumers. Uh, last point is that domain is really just the API. You know, the data product is really just the API. So in a lot of cases, that's SQL, right? That's the ability to look in a SQL database, but it could also be even something like a Kafka stream where you know, the, the marketing promotions domain, which reads from other domains, is, is just building a stream that's getting sent out to certain consumers. And across all of this, um, which is the part where, uh, where you might wanna have some centralization is around you know, some standards, some federated governance and the catalog that, that allows all of your end users to find the data that's in these domains. And, and something I want to add to this is there's one, one thing we want to be very careful about is uh, what I always say, don't boil the ocean, right? I think we're, we're very tempted to go figure out what are all these domains right now and start mapping them out. I think this is when we really need to start thinking about what is, who's asking for, for, for to, to solve their problems at a very kind of crucial state right now. So let's try to find those, ident identify what are those crucial pain points right now and map those out to the existing domains. And leading to the second point that I want to make is we're not going to go create these domains. These domains already exist implicitly. So it is part, uh, part of the work here is to identify what are those existing domains. And depending on, on, on your organization, maybe they'll be easier to identify. They'll be self-identifying. Maybe there's going to be some stuff that's going to be a mix. And I think this is what helps us realize that data mesh is a social technical paradigm shift. This is the social aspect you can go do. So two things to remember. One, don't boil the ocean. And second, these domains, you're not going to create them. You're going to identify them. They already exist within the organization. I think that's a great point. Like, uh, Paul, I loved how you talked about, you know, uh, these, these products can, can doesn't, and not everything is a product and products can be many different things, right? It can be an API. It can be a data set. It can be a data mart. It can be many different things. And Juan, your point around don't boil the ocean and, uh, and identifying domains is really important and you'll probably get it wrong, right? A lot of companies, they start off thinking their domains are one thing or that one particular domain or use case is the most important. Uh, and then they find out halfway through or partway through that, uh, you know, that it doesn't make sense. And, and it's important to be dynamic to, uh, to realizing that. Now, as you think about not boiling the ocean, you know, it's important to think about how you, you approach your scope and how your domains can affect your data catalog, right? And so if you're really focused on use cases that are more on the right side of that chart or more focused around sort of data consumers discovering assets, then perhaps what you're doing is developing more of an analytics catalog. And that has implications on sort of the scope of what you include there. Um, maybe you're really looking more at sort of the observability of the pipelines and things like that. And you're trying to understand more your upstream or your source domains than perhaps Perhaps you're doing more of a data platform catalog, or really maybe you're trying to kind of be comprehensive and, and cover everything and really get even more into something like compliance and sensitivity and things like that. Perhaps you're building out more of a granular resource graph. Um, obviously, you know, project the terms onto this chart that makes sense to you, but this gives you a little bit of an idea of, hey, am I starting from the top of this here? Am I starting from the bottom? How do I make sure I approach this in a way that really doesn't try to boil the whole ocean? So that brings us to our second key point here. Who are the key stakeholders when it comes to data mesh and to data governance? And for this section, we're actually gonna keep it pretty straight and simple here. We have this chart here of some of our different key stakeholders that we see that are really relevant to implementing and maintaining a data mesh and a data governance type of solution. Um, you see at the top here, data leadership, right? It's so, so important to have data leaders involved in the initiative, in the program, because if you don't have that buy-in, we see this over and over and over again, they, um, there isn't enough tying it to the strategy. Uh, and there isn't enough prioritization to really make sure that it's front and center. And there isn't enough of a push to really affect the culture because there's a ton of change management and culture shifting that has to happen to really move to more of a mesh mindset, to really think about data as products, and to really think about discovery and knowledge first as you're building out your, your uh, data mesh and catalog type environments. 
it's important to think about the interplay of consumers versus producers, right? There are the people producing the data. There are the people consuming the data for various use cases. And it isn't always clear cut. In some use cases, a consumer becomes a producer. Somebody does some prep on their laptop and then republishes a new modified data set. That consumer is now a producer. So this interplay is important and people wear different hats at different times. You then have folks that are a little bit more in that, that sort of um, uh, governance function more formally, right? Whether it's data governance people, privacy folks, security folks. Some of these folks may make sense to be centralized and be really more a part of that centralized approach to standardization. Uh, but if the more you can push responsibilities around governance, privacy, and security into the different domains, the more you're going to tie the implementation of these things to the unique aspects and use cases of those different groups and of those different domains. A lot of times that top-down approach is a little too divorced from the reality of how the data is being used, what's the actual meaning behind the data. And you can actually achieve not just better access to data, but better security and governance if you bring that responsibility closer to those different groups. And then finally, you've got platform teams, folks that are working on the underlying technology uh, and working on things like automation, right? Data ops and DevOps type approaches to really make governance more automated and leverage some of the great capabilities that things like your Snowflake or your data.world platform might provide. Uh, Juan and Paul, anything that you'd want to add on sort of the stakeholder side of things? Uh, one thing just on privacy and security is just um, making sure that you get uh, the right people involved early in the process. I know for a lot of for a lot of customers that we work with who are migrating, maybe they're on-prem systems to the cloud or starting to bring in additional data sources that have that have maybe more some some more sensitive data. The earlier that that you start understanding what the requirements are for storing that data and making that available. Uh, the better it'll, the, the, the shorter your timelines will be, be before you get those data products out and uh, the easier it'll be for everyone. Important point to realize is that there's many stakeholders here, right? So it's important to identify who are those stakeholders. And so actually a question to the audience, I would appreciate if people want to go chat and have the conversation is what other stakeholders would you consider that are not on this list? Um, so I'm very curious to see what the audience has to say. Great question. Yeah, feel free to chat into the uh, the chat there. Um, this brings us to our third point here, uh, which is a pretty meaty one, which is where should we standardize and productize data, right? Okay, so I'm convinced of this domain approach. I'm convinced around data as products, but what does that really mean? What really is data as a product? What really does it mean to standardize and where do I standardize? So with that, I'll pass it over to Juan to talk a little bit about data products and how to standardize them. Yeah, so if we go back, we look at uh, kind of the, one of the first writings from DJ Patil, he's a former US chief data scientist, he, he, has, he has a book and he describes the data product as it facilitates an end goal, right? And then Shamak Digani calls it as it, it, it is something that it provides, it's valuable and useful and usable. And the way I like to think about it is the same way we do shopping on our favorite e-commerce website, right? You go into that e-commerce website because you have an intention of something that you want, right? Something you have, something that you need and you're gonna go buy. And you go search for that. And then at the end, you find a bunch of results. Uh, the platform gives you ways to be able to go navigate that, filter things out, will give you the ratings, reviews, it gives you sponsored content, you can click on things, you can see how that product is being used, who bought that product with, with another product and so forth, you can see the feedback and so forth. What is important here to think about is that th this, that same kind of experience that you may go, that you go through when you go buy something on an e-commerce website, we should be thinking as data as that same type of experience. So um, what we have been working on uh, together with, uh, with Tim and folks at Data World is what we're calling the, the data product ABCs, right? And this is a framework that we're putting out there to see what does it mean to have a data as a product? So A is accountability. Is who owns this? Who is responsible for this data product? Uh, who fixes it when something breaks? Right? Who's, who's taking an account, uh, fo following up with all the feedback? Who is defining the requirements for what this data product is and so forth? B is boundaries. What is this data product? What is in it? What is it, not, what is it supposed to be? What is it planned to be? What is it not? Where is it going to live? 
Is it going to be uh, going to have a, a SQL interface, right? An API interface and so forth. What are the inputs and what are the outputs? Um, that's boundaries. C is for contracts and expectations. What are we expecting from this data product, right? What are the constraints? What are the tests that are being done about it? What are the quality uh, guarantees that are being done? What are the SLAs, SLOs around this stuff? How should this data product should be used? How could it be used? How can, how can it not be, how, sh how should it not be used? What is a performance, right? How is this maintained? Is this being updated? How often is this real time? Can it be used for different types of scenarios? These are the contracts and expectations. D is about downstream consumers. Who is actually going to be the consumer of this, right? This is a very, very important one because we need, we're not creating a product just for the sake of having some data out there. We need to understand who are the consumers, the users of those products. What are the use cases? What are their expectations on what do I need today versus what they're gonna probably need tomorrow? Who are the potential consumers of these data products? And E is about having explicit knowledge. I think this is one of the parts that we are missing in this current world that we live in of, of what I call the data first world, where it's just, we need to go start shifting into this, what I'm calling this knowledge first world, where we have knowledge as first class citizens. Let's understand what this is the schema around this data. What does this actually mean? How is this documented? Give me examples. How, are the, how is this data product related to other data products? So this is, in essence, how we're seeing a, a framework to start establishing what should a data product be. So when you're thinking about data, as a delivering as a product and bringing the product thinking, think about who's the accountability, the boundaries, the contracts and expectations, the downstream consumers, and the explicit knowledge. Back to you, Tim. No, this is, I'm so excited about this framework because a lot of folks are very confused about data products, right? And they're like, well, what does it mean to have a data product? Um, you know, this gives you a roadmap to really say, hey, like, do I know these things about this data product? Can I define them? If I can't, I should, right? And it also puts a little bit of rigor around data products, right? So, because there's there's this anti-pattern where it's easy to just say, oh, well, that table in this database, that's a data product. And this table over here, that's the data product, right? But if you don't really have ownership around it, if you don't really have expectations defined around it, you don't really know what the right use cases are that are supported versus not supported. You haven't documented it. It's really hard to say that that's a product, right? So if you're going to have less products and better products, that's, that's a good thing for your organization. And these data products can be different sort of shapes and sizes, right? You heard about things like uh, an API being a data product, a data set can be a data product, even things like aggregations where you're combining different data products together to create either new or just combined data products. These are all potentially data products and they all can benefit from having this kind of ABC uh, approach applied to them. And I think what's really exciting, and, and Paul's going to go into this, is thinking about how this fits into your own data infrastructure and some of the considerations uh, around how to implement this practically from an architecture perspective. So, Paul, over to you. Yeah, and here's an example. This this shows the Snowflake Data Cloud, but it really, you know, really could be data products coming from all kinds of different places. Um, but you can see uh, the the I love the little owl so that we know that data.world is, you know, they, they're cataloging all the assets across the organization, including the external sources that are used for the data products for the different domains. Um, but uh, it's all centrally managed by the catalog or by, an, you know, an exchange um, or in combination of those things so that everyone gets access to those, to all of those products. Go to the next slide. And the nice thing, or when you're thinking about these, um, it, it's then you start thinking about how do I group these products? You know, are they grouped by, you know, if, if they're in a database, do I group them by database? You know, have a domain, a, a database per domain? Do I have schema per domain? Um, you also, in the Snowflake Data Cloud, you also have the ability to have uh, each domain in its own Snowflake account, and they can each even be in a different cloud, in a different region. It doesn't really matter. The consumers can be in different clouds, different regions. The goal is that I, I know where all my data is 
I've got a centralized way to find it, to discover it, make it available to all my consumers. Um, and that it's, they're all, you know, using the, the same um, standards around governance and security. One of the one of the things I want to chime in here is is yeah. to note what I call the the two lenses of a catalog, right? Actually, you can see here the two owls of data.world, one outside and one in the inside, and that's on purpose. So for the for the outsider one, I call this this you want to be able to think about the data catalog for the audience of a data producer. So they're going to be cataloging that the raw technical data from all those sources and, and the data teams. Right, the, the teams that are, that are for each domain that are taking all those data sources to be able to go deliver that data product, they need to go use a catalog to understand where are all the tables and columns on my sources, right? Where is the sensitive data? Let me understand the lineage of, about, about all the existing application sources that you have. Once those do, domains start generating those data products, those data products need to be cataloged too. And that's the second lens of a catalog. It's the catalog for the data consumers. And that's what you see in the center right there, right? You wanna be in, you wanna have that inventory of all those data products. So when the consumers come in, they go into the catalog, they're gonna go look for those data products that they're actually gonna be able to go use and consume. It's very similar to that same experience that you're having at that e-commerce website and you're finding that product that you're actually gonna go buy. So those are two experiences of a catalog. So one is for the producers, which is gonna be much more technical uh, to be able to do the, you, you, things like invent, uh, technical inventory, having uh, lineage, having sensitive data and so forth. And then that second lens of the catalog, which is here are the data products that you have those A, B, C, D, E's, right? You know exactly who's accountable, you know what the roadmap is and how it can be used and how it's connected with other data products. So those, that's something very important for us to, to, to realize here. Yeah, and that's a great point uh, because for on the on the left side, you've got your, you know your data producers, your data engineers that really need to take raw materials and turn them into finished goods that can then be used by the by the consumers. So that's I, I, I love I love that analogy, Paul. I think that's how that's the way to go think about it, right? So you have the engineers, like the, the producers, who are taking those raw goods and they're turning it into a product, and that's get gets cataloged into the in, into the lens of the for the consumers. Yeah, I think I think that's a great point. Re regardless of whether that that data product lives a little bit further upstream or it's something that's really really sort of at the tail end, very end consumer facing. Um, I, I think what's also exciting about this is um, really trying to separate technology as an enabler, right? So one aspect of that is sort of the global nature of how you can implement something like. Uh, Snowflake, not just global, but also multi-cloud. Uh, and I know on this next slide here, there's also a bunch of specific pieces of functionality that um, work really well in conjunction with a catalog offering that um, uh, that Snowflake has that helps to implement this in a well-governed way. Yeah, and it's the catalog is really key to a lot of this. So, um, you know, on the left, we talked earlier about knowing your data. And, it, and in Snowflake, we have the ability to tag items as sensitive data, or you, you really any, you can tag it in any way, automatically classify sensitive data. Um, you can, you can use, you know, within Snowflake, you can see what, you know, what, how uh, objects were, were built, you can see the lineage, you can see what, you know, what are dependent. So if I have, for example, uh, a, a, a table, I want to know what views, what stored procedures, all those things, what's dependent on that object. And then I can see who is actually uh, accessing that object. And that's really important. If I'm a producer, I really do want to know who's using the data that I produce, what's useful to them, what's not useful to them. And you're just trying to make it easy. And then that's all surfaced in the data catalog. For protecting your data, there's policies at the row level, who can, you know, there may be some data that, you know, for example, people in the US are allowed to see some data that people in EMEA have different data that they see. Um, you can mask data, you can uh, tokenize it so that you basically encrypt particular sensitive items or, or you know, mask based on a different column. And all of that allows you to securely share that data um, and when we talk about secure data sharing and in the picture before, it really means not moving the data around, but keeping it all within that data cloud and, and 
you know, sharing it live so that as it changes or when the, you know, as the new feed comes in for the data product, the consumers see it in real time. Yeah, I think these are really powerful capabilities here. And, uh, you know, one, in our previous conversation, Paul and I uh, and a couple others were chatting about, you know, when you think about whether it's data mesh or really other types of architectures as well, you know, Snowflake can really serve as, uh, you know, or, you know, in general, like your data lake, data warehouse, data cloud type environment can serve as that sort of computational platform environment. Uh, and then something like your catalog, like data.world can be that sort of experience layer that helps you find, understand, and surface a lot of this information as well. So that's a great sort of combined yeah. approach to being able to address sort of how do we standardize things? How do we build these products? And then how do we, you know, make these things be discoverable, accessible, and protected all in a, in a very smart way? Um, so we've got two more key points to hit here, and we'll move a little quickly because we, uh, uh, we're, we've got about 10 more minutes of formal content here before we move into our Q&A. So the fourth point is, who is responsible, right? We mentioned it in those ABCs of data product, but this is a really key question. So we're going to really kind of zoom into it and bring it front and center. And, you know, whether you're going to call them data stewards or data owners or data producers, data custodians, data trustees, side note, there are so many terms for what you call people that are helping with uh, with your data and taking ownership and accountability around data. Uh, personally, I'm a big fan of the data product manager term, even though it's a little newer and, and still kind of coming uh, into the limelight. Um, really, it's all about accountability, right? And accountability, ideally is the fewest number of people possible, right? Because the more you spread accountability and responsibility, it's kind of like, who's on first, right? Um, so it gets more complicated, but you know, some of us work at much larger or more complex organizations. And these questions like, you know, who defines the requirements versus who fixes it versus the roadmap versus the expertise, can be sometimes separated. And so you may see that even though maybe the owner is the data steward or the data product manager, that maybe you know the data custodian is really the person who fixes it when it breaks, right? And that is sort of like a data engineer or an IT person or DBA or whoever that might be, right? Who has the expertise? Maybe the steward and the data custodian have some of that expertise, but you've got some key subject matter experts, some SMEs that are the experts around that data. So think about in your own organization, who are the people that fit the answer to these questions? And what are the fewest number of critical hats needed in order to really accomplish appropriate, comprehensive, um, smart accountability around your data? And one thing that I would really encourage you all to think about is consider how to minimize the amount of sort of middle people in this overall flow, right? One of the things that Data Mesh is trying to move away from is the idea that there has to be this bottleneck of sort of the data engineers that work in a centralized team that are trying to grapple with all these inbound domains that are you know, sort of on the producer side and all these like outbound consumption patterns from the data consumers. And, you know, basically they're a ticket taking organization that is uh, not given enough context, right? Um, how can you get more direct? data producer and data consumer collaboration, where engineers are either working on that centralized data platform, they're working on that set of self-service capabilities that empower the producers and consumers, or they are embedded with the domains, right? They are working side by side with the producers. Maybe they are the producers and they're the ones working directly with consumers. So think about how you can remove some of this playing the telephone game uh, when you think about accountability and responsibility. And if we look back at that um, that architecture example that Paul showed earlier with the domains and mapping them there, you should also think about how not just can you associate responsibility with domains, but can you shift some of that responsibility more to the left of this diagram, right? So for example, rather than having a bunch of customer expertise down on the right-hand side, if you know that you've got a customer system, that domain customer on the top there, where a lot of that customer sort of expertise and the actual people who are using your CRM or other systems, uh, where that's where they're operating, can you shift more of that responsibility to them and empower the people that are making the data? Not only are they often going to have that expertise, um, but also when things break, 
they're the ones who have to fix it, right? And the more that we can associate the SLOs, the SLAs, and the sort of the value, uh, the operational value of the data with the folks that um, that sort of manage those systems, uh, the better that we're going to have data reliability and minimize data downtime across the entire organization. Well, one thing I do want to add is that we have to, it, as you said, Tim, and I agree, we want to be able to kind of shift ownership towards the left, but that may not always be possible. Right. And so, so it's always the answer of it depends where this goes. If you are going to go, if you are a domain or creating products that is combining existing data products, then you're probably already naturally going to be living more towards the right. So I think it, it, again, it's, we have to be under, we have to understand kind of the social dynamics within an organization. Where do we have technical expertise? In an ideal world, we will, I, I, I think we will start seeing domains like what we're seeing here that will have their own data teams. Uh, and so you'll have a data team associated to each domain. At some, but when, uh, your starting point is I may have be very centralized and I'm starting to go decentralized. So it's, it will be little by little this shifting. The moment that you start seeing more data teams live in each domain, that, that, is, when we, that is when we will start seeing more of this shifting towards the left. But again, it is kind of depending on the culture of, of, of centralization and decentralization that you are within your organization and how you try to, what you're trying to aspire to, to be more centralized or more decentralized and finding that balance. I think that is also one of the key takeaways that we want you to have is you need to be able to look for that balance between centralization and decentralization. Mm -hmm. And I think one other really, really important point is also uh, going back to what's all the way on the left, which is the data sources, you know, traditionally we've all seen where we, we try to take all those data sources and then figure out, you know, what all that data is. And really what data mesh is doing for you is by having data products, they're, they're, they're letting the owners or the domain experts really figure out those sources, um, pull them together, make them usable by consumers, and that's really why you want as much, you know, move to the left as possible, you know, where you can. Yep. Uh, great, great points here. And hopefully this provides you a bit of a recipe book to approach this within your own organizations in terms of where are your domains, how do they map together, and where can responsibility be associated so those people that are working with that data on the left-hand side can help to make the lives better of, of everyone in the organization, including and especially the folks that are to the right of them. Last point here, how to be agile. And one of the things that we want to recommend as a, as a big a sort of final takeaway here is that you can apply agile software practices to your governance and your cataloging approach as well. Uh, and one of the things that we want to advocate is this idea of agile data governance, the idea of creating and improving data assets and, your, and, and improving your knowledge and management of data in a collaborative and iterative way. This is about empowering the usage of data safely. And it adapts the deeply proven best practices of agile and open software to data and analytics. Um, and we won't go into the details of this. Feel free to go to data.world uh, and, and check out, we have like an, a, an ADG uh, white paper and some webinars and things. But this is kind of the chart that we really direct people towards that is sort of a non-vendor specific approach to how to iterate around your data. And it's about building a use case backlog really identifying the key questions, that's gonna help you understand all sorts of things, like who are the consumers to focus on, who are the, what are the domains to focus on first, curate those data assets or those data products, and then focus on really creating a, an environment where producers and consumers can work together and then take those learnings and feed it back in, right? So try to get those data products out there quickly and then make them better and better and better. Don't boil the ocean. Don't try to take three years and a massive waterfall approach to trying to address your governance needs because ultimately, if you take that waterfall-driven approach, you know this top sort of set of bars here can take years and sometimes you never get there, right? They say the average um, tenure of a CDO is about two and a half years. Um, and if you can't get your catalog or your governance program in place in two and a half years, then the reset button gets hit, right? So you have to take this iterative use case driven approach. 
So with our key takeaways, I'm going to pass it over to Juan. It's actually a fun sort of um, connection to uh, what we do in our catalog and cocktails podcast, where we end with our takeaways. So Juan, take us away with your takeaways. All right. Well, so we first discussed on what is the scope, right? We, def- uh, we are talking about what are they, let's identify those domains. And guess what? You're already doing that work, right? They already exist. So let's go identify those domains. And we really want to depend on, uh, identify the priorities you want to solve. Are you doing more analytics type of work? Do you really need to be able to have, go all the way to map out all the resources within your enterprises, how they're being connected? So that's number one, the scope. Number two is who are the stakeholders of your data catalog? I think always, always we need to have data leadership involved. We need to have executives involved in this. And second, there's a, there's a plethora of different types of, of stakeholders, consumers, producers, governance, privacy, security, platforms, and, and, and there could be more. Please be aware of all those stakeholders to make sure that you're bringing in all the particular knowledge that is needed. Third, this whole idea of standardization or the data products. We are presenting here today our data products ABCs. Um, you can go next. I think we're the ABCs, accountability, boundaries, contracts and expectations, downstream consumers, and explicit knowledge. And this can happen in so many different uh, places, right? At the consumption layer, uh, data management layer, the data producing system. So identify where is this ownership going to occur? Fourth. When you think about who is the responsibility, again, this is when we really need to go focus on the accountability. Who's the owner? Where are the requirements going to come from? Who's going to fix something if it breaks? What are the roadmaps? Where are the expertise around these data products? And finally, we need to be agile. We need to empower the usage of data safely. And we can do this by let's identify the backlog of questions that people are trying to go answer and map them to particular domains. And we go through the whole kind of agile process. Let's do have sprints, peer reviewed, collaborate, and iterate. These are the five main takeaways we want everybody to go have. And then to wrap up and ready for some questions. Um, if you're interested in learning more about data mesh and data governance, we just released this white paper right now. You can go to data world and resources, and you can go find all our take on what the data, data mesh is, right? All, in addition to the four pillars, we really like to tell people it's data as a product and finding that balance between centralization and decentralization. And you can find more details about the data, the, the data products ABCs framework that we have in here. Awesome. Thanks so much for the great takeaways there and the action step here. Uh, and just as we transition to questions here, thank you, Paul, so much for joining us. You bring such great expertise from the Snowflake side. Really excited to be partners with you all. And with that, uh, we'll pass it back to you, Shannon. Thank you all for this great presentation. It's been very informative. Uh, and just to answer the most commonly asked questions, uh, just to note, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Thursday with links to the slides and links to the recording along with anything else requested throughout here. So diving in, um, and if you have questions for, for any of our speakers here, feel free to put it in the Q&A section. Um, is data mesh suitable for organizations with low data management maturity who are just starting out on their data governance journey? Is it too big a leap to start with the, uh, if the organization is very siloed currently and data management is immature? I think that's a, a super excellent question. And it's one that I think not just the three of us are thinking about, but really the whole industry is thinking about related to data meshes. When is it right to do data mesh and when shouldn't you do data mesh, right? Uh, and obviously there are gonna be some situations where maybe you're a really small company or you're just looking within a particular department and you're like, hey, you know what? I don't really have the political sort of position or situation right now to be trying to push data mesh across the organization. Or maybe it just doesn't make sense yet because of the scale of what you're doing. And that's okay. Not everyone has to do data mesh. Not everyone has to break it into 10 or 20 or 100 domains. Like, that, you know, do what's right for your organization, I think is really key. I think that being said, what's really exciting about data mesh in my mind, and, and Juan and Paul, I'm curious if this kind of connects for your own philosophies on this as well, is that data mesh ends up being a pretty scalable model. So even if you only really have one or two domains, even if you know, your accountable or responsible individuals are pretty consolidated, there's only one name associated with each of these products, even if you only have two or three products to start, 
that's okay. You can start small. The model actually kind of facilitates starting small and growing in sort of this organic uh, method over time. Paul Juan, would you would you kind of say the same thing there or add to that? Yeah, it's it, the key is really about when to get started. You can, I think you put it perfectly, Tim. Starting starting small with you know even a single domain or just to get the methodology right, just to really understand what's important around governance around defining the products who are the you know who are the consumers who are you know what are the use cases all of that is you know we, we, we're calling it data mesh it's you, you should be doing it anyway and if you do it and in such a way that you can push the not you know the 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 producers down to the people that really have knowledge of the data then that really is important and helpful yeah, I, I want to add. I want to add to this. Um, first of all, let's actually kind of, my, from my honest perspective, let's take the word data mesh out for now, and 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 replace this replace the question. Uh, the word data mesh here is: Should I do? Should I treat data as a product for my organization? I think you should. I think everybody should start treating data as a product, and I think everybody should start bringing in product thinking into data. Now, the question is: How do we start doing this? Uh, I think th this is where you, you, if, if your executive or kind of leadership says, we need to start treating data as a product, you, that's that's the type of kind of leadership mandate that you want to go have. That, that's one thing. Other techniques, uh, tactics that we've seen is, you know what, there are people who are really desperate to get their answers, to get, get their questions to their answers to their questions. And, and, you, and they probably have our, the famous shadow IT. A lot of this, I think, it is an opportunity to take those folks who are already doing that work, who already have that type of knowledge that's going on, and saying, hey, let's actually, let's take this ad hoc process, and let's go figure out what that process could look like to start generating products so that we can start standardizing a little bit what this product is. And it becomes that first kind of what I call an iron thread, and it becomes an example for other places. This is a paradigm shift. It is not just about technology. It's a social technical paradigm shift and change is hard. And I remember talking to one of my colleagues, I remember it's like, who, when, we, when, when we wanted to go to the moon 50, 60 years ago, people were crazy about that. Who are the crazy people who wanna be the astronauts in your organization who are like, I'm up for the challenge for this change. And those folks go find those folks who are ready for that and test this out first with them. Bringing treating data as a product and have it be as an example, so people can start getting starts kind of a snowball effect. I love it, and there's been a lot of requests for the uh, link to the white paper, and, and I put it in the chat there, so everybody has access to that as well. And there's also um, uh, the link for the ebook as a request. So, and I will. Be sure and get these uh, links to everybody in the follow-up email as well. Uh, if you have additional questions, um, feel free to submit them in the Q&A section. We've got just a couple of minutes left here. So I'm not sure, uh, Tim or Juan, or if you can answer this question. Is, uh, is Microsoft's common data model also using data mesh architecture, or is it two different concepts? I, I can talk about that. So it's... It, so a, a data model is a, is a part of it, but a data product is really around the model and the data. So you might use the data model as a building block for, you know, for your domain. If, I, if, if there's a common data model for, for example, for uh, you know, finance or, or banking or something like that, I might use that in building my data product, but my data product actually includes my data and all the sources and how I turn it into that finished product. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Paul. The one thing that I would add is that, um, you know, the common data model was kind of developed with originally sort of the, the, the way that Dynamics 365 is put together. So it's a great sort of starting point if obviously if you're using Dynamics um, as your sort of CRM, um, it's also, um, uh, a great inspiration for like how you'd might design your domains or how you'd might uh, approach a semantic layer um, to some of your data. Like if you're thinking about what my glossary might start to look like, how might I organize it, that kind of thing. Um, so I think it's great inspiration for that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, obviously one size rarely fits all. So figure out what makes sense for your own organization. Yeah. And, and I want to add to that. This is, you have to be very careful. Let's not boil the ocean. 
right? I think it's a great inspiration, these existing common data models. And I think once you start finding the centralization versus decentralization kind of balance for you, there are things, there are models that you want to be able to go centralize. For example, our definition of what is a contact information and telephone numbers. There may be regulatory reasons we need to have that centralized, right, for GDPR and so forth. Uh, and then different domains can, can reuse those existing models and you reuse them as is. They can extend them themselves. And then also domains can probably create their own models. And then and what we also see is that there's going to be friction between different people creating different stuff. And, I, and we say, that's fine. Embrace that friction. The world is complex. We cannot expect to go simplify it. And that friction is probably significant, significant is that there is some energy going on. And that's where we should go to get some focus on. And that's how we know that there's priority. So uh, I think it's, again, finding that balance between centralization and decentralization and don't boil the ocean. I love it. Well, thank you all again for this great presentation. Lots of kudos going on in the chat here um, and lots of requests for the links. And again, I'll get both. I didn't get the chance to get the ebook into the uh, chat there for y'all, but I'll get that in the follow-up email uh, again, which I'll send out by to all registrants by end of day Thursday with uh, links to the white paper, or the ebook, the slides and the recording from this session. Thank you all. And thanks to data.world for sponsoring today's webinar and thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do we just loved it thank you guys so much and we all have a great day yeah thank you so much for having us thanks all bye all right cheers everyone